Well, hello again. Uh, here's another good one for the yes or no treatment. And it may not be the biggest one in the world, although it's getting there, but it is certainly going to be one of the most contentious. And that is this. Should we pay slavery reparations? Well, what this is really about is whether the rich countries that benefited greatly from slavery in the past one way or another, either being in the business or using them or transporting them or whatever, uh, whether or not they should pay reparations to the descendants of those who were enslaved. Well, I have to admit, I, I didn't really pay much attention to this. I wasn't really aware of what a, a, a big thing it has become. It is huge. Uh, there are a great number of uh, movements, uh, initiatives going on all over the place, and especially in, in the U.S., but also in Britain. Um, and the whole question of whether reparations should be paid specifically to black people who were enslaved uh, has been given a lot of momentum by the big Black Lives Matter movement. I suppose that uh, stupid cop in Minneapolis that, that uh, killed that man in that much videoed um, event has probably done more for her reparations than any other single person, including societies and professors and congressmen and so forth. In any case, uh, the logic is this, that uh, because of the way the uh, freedoms of the people who were enslaved were removed, because of the way in which their lives were basically crushed, uh, and because of the huge economic benefit that countries gain from uh, treating them this way, in other words, not really having to pay them, <laughs> uh, th there is uh, some you know, moral requirement for uh, some kind of putting it right. Uh, that's, really, that's really the logic of the thing. And uh, in the States, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on this thing. Uh, individual uh, communities are uh, addressing the subject. During the uh, last presidential election campaign, two of the candidates uh, advocated reparations for uh, slavery. Uh, the current uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, uh, uh, the third in line to the presidency, if something should happen to the other two, uh, has spoken out and introduced some legislation. So this is becoming a big thing. Uh, this uh, video will concentrate arguments more on the U.S. because there's more happening over there, but it's certainly not uh, irrelevant here in the U.K. Uh, uh, the U.K., of course, uh, was pretty much the progenitor of slavery in, in the U.S. It, uh, it transported the slaves there it, and it enriched itself in the process. Uh, uh, so much so that they say that many of the richest families in the U.K. owe their riches going all the way back to the money they made from the slave trade. So uh, uh, both countries, both countries have a lot to answer for in this. Um, and uh, <laughs> oh dear, what a controversy this is going to become. It's going to become a real fight, I think. Okay, well, let's get on to it. Uh, so, what are some of the arguments in favor of paying reparations? Well, I guess the, the main argument is, is the one that I've already mentioned, which is, in a way, it's to make up for the disadvantage that was uh, burdened upon uh, the black slaves that came over from Africa uh, to work in plantations in, uh, in, in America, also in the Caribbean and South America, uh, and the way in which those who owned them benefited greatly from it, and that's, you know, manifestly unfair and, and, and cruel and something ought to be done about it. That's the basic logic of the argument. and. And in a kind of moral and even emotional sense, it's kind of hard to argue with. 
course, there are plenty of arguments against doing it, but, but the notion of putting something right that has long been uh, ignored uh, is uh, a pretty good one. Uh, in, in fact, there was an effort uh, by President Lincoln to do something about this, but after he met his demise in Ford's theater, <laughs> Uh, the, the movement died down and nothing, nothing further was done about it. Uh, and uh, lest we become too uh, smug here in Britain about it, don't forget that not only did we, in effect, manage the slave trade here, but when abolition took place in the 1830s, uh, it was just really a change in asset format for slave owners because they were compensated enormously, enormously for the loss of their slaves. So much so that it, uh, it was the biggest financial burden uh, perhaps ever undertaken by this country to, to provide that compensation. So, uh, you know, the, the <laughs> there's a lot of burden here to do something about it and do it decently. Uh, Next, uh, there are quite a few uh, places within the U.S. where things are happening now. There are towns and states, state of California, uh, city of Chicago, Evanston, Illinois, places like that that are uh, actively designing a reparations endeavor. Now, how far they'll get, uh, what form it will take uh, remains to be seen, but, it, but it's in progress. So, that suggests that it really is a, a, a serious endeavor. Uh, furthermore, there's uh, a lot of precedent for this. Uh, uh, some of you may recall the, that the Americans uh, interned the Japanese citizens, Japanese American citizens during the Second World War uh, for uh, reasons that we needn't go into right now. Uh, but after the war, they were compensated quite substantially uh, for the uh, indignity and suffering uh, that they experienced. Similarly, the Native Americans, the Indians, have been compensated. Some would say um, uh, not adequately, but nonetheless, uh, they have been. Uh, there were compensation arrangements uh, for them. And, of course, it's happened in other countries. Uh, there was compensation in South Africa at the end of the apartheid movement. Uh, perhaps most spectacularly, Germany, uh, after, the, after the Second World War and what they did to the Jews, uh, paid a, a very large amount of uh, reparation to the Jewish community. And uh, uh, in today's money, it, it amounted to something like seven or eight uh, billion dollars. So, you know, a lot, a lot has been paid. So there's a precedent, there's form here. So this wouldn't be the first time that uh, compensating uh, oppressed people for the indignity and losses they suffered uh, was uh, undertaken. And uh, here in the UK, uh, uh, there are actually some uh, compensation reparation initiatives being undertaken by some big companies who uh, realize that uh, much of their current uh, wealth and competitive strength is based upon uh, the uh, work of slaves many years ago. So, so the arguments are pretty straightforward for reparations. Uh, I suppose they basically come down to two or three. One is they deserve it because the people in question were, were horribly treated and, and were never adequately uh, looked after uh, because of that. And number two, there's a lot of precedent for it. It's, it's happening in different places, on different levels, and so forth. And number three, uh, it, it's, a, it's a subject whose time has come because of the growing uh, pressure by the non-white community for uh, equal treatment under the law, and uh, especially in the U.S., but to a secondary, secondary extent here in the U.K. So, uh, it, it's a big thing right now, and uh, my guess is that uh, it, it won't be easily stopped. Okay, well, now, unsurprisingly, there are a lot of people who uh, oppose this. Uh, and uh, let, let's, let's go into the, some of their arguments. No, we shouldn't, we shouldn't pay slavery reparations. First of all, as a kind of uh, setting to this 
part of the video, let's, let's just say that some polls have been taken about how people feel about this. And, and one of them uh, suggested that about half of all black Americans support reparations. It's a surprise they don't all support it, but anyway, there it is. Uh, maybe they see some uh, fundamental flaws in it. And, but only about 10% of the white population. So uh, depending on who you listen to, uh, there is a lot of support for it, but it's racially divided and, and you'll probably get quite different results depending on who's, uh, who's taking the polls. So, <laughs> uh, in my experience, a lot of chicanery goes on amongst poll takers. And so this one, if, if, if anyone ever, is certainly gonna be subject to those sorts of pressures. So you don't know what to believe. All we know is there's a lot of people who don't want it done. Um, the next thing is uh, some people would say on both sides of the Atlantic, wait a minute, why should I bear any burden uh, which uh, addresses a crime, ill treatment, uh, bad behavior of uh, somebody many, many years ago? I had nothing to do with that. It's not my fault. Why should I have to cough up, as it were? And I think that uh, that argument resonates, particularly in tough times, particularly as we think about the situation that uh, the nations are in, both Britain and America, after the coronavirus. Uh, the financial pressures are extreme. The spending levels, to put coronavirus right, have never been so high. And this is not the time to be thinking about these kind of grandiose gestures, however well-intentioned they may be. Well, another one of the arguments is that uh, the question of why anybody should be paid compensation who is no longer alive doesn't make any sense. The victims are dead. Uh, and uh, therefore, it becomes more of an, a kind of an emotional one, really, than one that, that has any kind of basis in, in common sense. And similarly, uh, on a kind of a similar basis, uh, some would say that actually the reparations, the atonement, as it were, for slavery, uh, was carried out by the the North side in the Civil War. There was there was slaughter. There were many people that were killed, uh, basically fighting on a principle, uh, and the principle was that slavery was wrong, and uh, so a lot of people stepped up to bat. So. The nation can justifiably think, well, we've done our bit. <laughs> we did it uh, uh, between 1861 and 1865, and, 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 that should be, and that should be enough. Furthermore, those who cite the example of Germany paying reparations to the Jews after the war overlook the fact that uh, Germany was defeated in the war, was subject to uh, uh, an almost uh, humiliating uh, set of uh, conditions and reparations itself and so forth. And so those reparations were pretty much uh, forced upon them. Uh, had they not lost the war, they wouldn't have been paying any reparations. So in a sense, uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a good comparison, not a good example to uh, to use to uh, illustrate the uh, appropriateness and necessity for reparations in the circumstances that, that we're talking about. Well, that's about the size of the arguments. Uh, the arguments really come down to why should it be my problem? I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, we've already done a lot uh, and uh, it's, a, uh, it's somebody else's problem. Okay, well, uh, those are the arguments on both sides, uh, strongly felt, I'm quite sure. Uh, and uh, I must say, uh, there's some um, dark aspects to it as well, which I'll get to in, in a moment. So I'm gonna talk about my take. Well, to begin with, uh, I must say that the strong opposition to paying reparations, I am afraid, I'm afraid coincides quite closely with racism itself. The people in America of whom, as we have noticed uh, with President Trump's supporters who don't like black people, who don't want them to be given any kind of a break, are also going to be the people who oppose reparations. So 
So that's a pretty unpleasant truth, but we might as well face it. The same thing here in Britain, really. Uh, the uh, not only it's not only the National Front, but but the uh, you know protectors of tradition and privilege here, who uh, oh, I won't say universally, but very widely benefited from uh, slavery, are not going to want this. So so the 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 attitudes and motives toward. Uh, behind not doing anything about this uh, have a sort of an unpleasant undertone. Beyond that, it seems to me that, that grave injustices have occurred. Uh, you know, there's no question about this. Uh, there's no question in my mind that on both sides of the Atlantic and in the Caribbean, because here in Britain we have a lot of uh, black people from the Caribbean uh, resident here, uh, were very much uh, subject to the horror and, and economic disadvantage of being enslaved. And, and uh, it seems like there's a pretty good case for, for doing something about that. How, how can we, how can we uh, provide some economic uh, atonement, not just uh, saying we're sorry? Uh, well, my thought about this is it's very complicated to come up with something like this that will be workable. How do you know who should get it, uh, how it should be paid, who should pay it, uh, what the money should be used for, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think it's worth uh, thinking about and giving some consideration to. So my suggestion is this. Uh, if a way could be found to identify those people who are the direct descendants of the enslaved, uh, and I would guess a fairly high percentage of the black people on both sides of the Atlantic probably fall into that category, and then give them an opportunity to uh, better themselves in further education. Uh, for example, by providing scholarship or even free tuition in, in schooling and, in, and at universities for those people. Uh, how would that be uh, funded? Perhaps by uh, voluntary contribution from, from the public, uh, from uh, organizations that feel they, they feel a bit guilty and who want to atone a bit or who just feel that the principle is worth supporting and then the rest made up from, the, uh, from public funds. Uh, so there it is. It's a tough subject. It's one that is not going to go away. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's worthy of debate, which is what I'm trying to do with this video. <laughs> well, glad you, uh, glad you stayed with me on it, uh, and I hope if you did like it, uh, you'll give me a like, you'll subscribe, notify, uh, comment, etc., etc., and I'll see you at the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.